Welcome to Creeping It Real. I am Judah. I want to talk to you about a movie called Malice. Now, this is not a movie I just happened upon. Somebody reached out to me, Gerald Crumb, the director, and uh, he asked me, how can I get you some movies to uh, check out? So I directed him to my Instagram, Creeping It Real Horror, and he DM'd me some links to some screeners. And I chose to watch his movie, Malice. This is very low budget. I think I read $100,000 and it's independent. Low budget horror is not new to me. They generally are hideous, but I think this movie is a diamond in the rough. Dealing with some kind of evil. It can possess the nearly dead. Okay, the first thing I want to point out, when I first started watching this movie, one of the first positive thoughts that I had was the setting. I was thinking whoever the location scout is, is amazing because this house that they're at is fantastic for this movie. Now, I was talking to Gerald, uh, talking, uh, we were chatting back and forth on Instagram, and he told me that this was actually built for the movie. He mentioned that over the three weeks shoot, things got really disgusting. The house got filled with bugs and rodents and everything was covered with blood. But if that's true, this they did an amazing job. Look at this. Look at this paneling, this wood with the chipped off and appealing paint. That is fantastic. It sets the mood for this kind of backwoods house so perfectly and they set up just random crap sitting on the shelves there's like a, a bottle for feeding cattle <laughs> there's fly swatters hanging up on the wall it was just too perfect I used to live when I was very young we we did not have money very poor mentioned before milk powder poor we lived in a home like this uh, simply because uh, the, the owner rented it to us so cheap uh, with the idea that we would be doing work on the home as we were there. And that's what we did. And this is, when you see this set, this really does uh, fit what the building looked like as we were working on it. Now, the decor, no, we did not set up, my apologies, we did not, you know, set up things to look like we were rednecks. Um, we had high expectations for the future of our home. So we, you know, when we finished a room, it definitely didn't look like what's going on here. It looked nice. But let's keep this going. Any one of us could be next. <laughs> Now, another one of my first notes was that I really kind of liked this paper plate thing. I, I thought that was decent. I enjoyed the drawing on it. The I thought there was a nice spattering of blood on there, the one eye being cut out. I, I thought that was good. Uh, it didn't frighten me, but I really liked the imagery of it. <laughs> Was that not scary? I know something scary. I'm good at this. Okay, here's another thing that I find interesting. This guy uh, leaning against the door in the background here, his character's name is Remington. Now, apparently this actor, because this is low budget, um, and a lot of these actors, this is not their full-time gig. They have second jobs that they're working. This guy could not be there during the shooting with all the other actors. So all of his stuff is filmed separately to work within, you know, when he could be off of work. 
and they had to make sure that all the angles were set up properly. Like right here, this is what I was told by Gerald anyway. So, uh, they had to set up things and pre-plan extensively to be able to make this work. So when he told me that this character Remington didn't film any of his parts with the other actors, I was like, whoa, that's crazy. I said, I almost feel like I have to watch this movie a second time just so I can see. But right here in the trailer, we have a character with Remington. So there was either just one time when they were able to pull this off or they legitimately set this up and they have Remington off in the back, you know, out of focus. And then they have this foreground character that they overlaid later on, which is a possibility. But if they did that, they did also a fantastic job because I'm not seeing any split screen here unless they took the time to rotoscope around this guy in the foreground. I don't know, but honestly, it's impressive. Bravo. Bravo to you guys. So, um, do you have any family? I had a goldfish once. It'll make them so happy. <laughs> I really liked the idea of this puppet. That character Remington at the beginning of the movie, it all starts off with him grieving the loss of his goldfish, Goldie. And uh, it starts off with him walking in uh, their yard going to bury his goldfish while his mom belittles him for, <laughs> for loving his fish. Then this puppet pops up throughout the movie talking to him uh, as an evil, an evil spirit kind of trying to use his goldfish to uh, persuade him or seduce him to do evil things. I, I really liked this goldfish. I also like the fact that they did not try to hide the hand holding the puppet. It, when it first shows up, it makes you think, is this Remington holding the puppet? Is Remington cracking? Is, is this his psyche talking to him? And he's like holding this puppet talking to himself. So I love the fact that the hand is actually in there as well. I'm happy. We don't have to leave. We can play games. Not in this cabin. You can get a hold of this movie on Apple TV and Vudu. Now, there are things that I appreciate about this movie, but there are definitely things that it suffers uh, from the limitations that it's working with. When Gerald reached out to me and he sent me these links, I, I gave him somewhat of an out. Uh, I said, hey, man, I'll watch this, but I want you to know I'm going to be honest because I don't want to be a shill. I want this to be authentic. And to his credit, he said, go for it. Go for the honesty. And I appreciate that because a lot of these mainstream people, you know, these, these big studios, if they know that you're going to talk trash about your movie, about their movie, there is no way they're going to send you a screener because they want you to be quiet. They only want good press. So bravo once again to Gerald for 100% being a man and saying, you know, come at me, bro. I can take it. This movie starts off with this, this guy, Remington. You think, like I mentioned, he's burying his goldfish, Goldie. He's sad. Uh, he, he goes back into his home that's out in the woods. It appears that he's living with his mom. For the most part, you don't see his mom. She's just in the background yelling things at him, slightly belittling him. Uh, as he's walking through this home, 
this is when it struck me how fantastic the location was, how perfect it was. I was really just struck. There's this one scene where they're kind of looking through a, a pantry. Uh, that's all I could call it. That's what, what came to my mind, a pantry with Remington in a doorway standing by the entrance to the house. And you just see stuff on the sides of the wall, stuff stacked in the shelves and so forth. And there's an old dirty fly swatter just hung up there. And for some reason, I was like, yeah, they get it. <laughs> the fly swatter just really did it for me, man. I just was super into it. His mom's being all like, you love that fish too much, all that kind of stuff. And you better start getting ready for bed. All these kind of things make me feel like Remington has been living with his mom. But then when he goes to get his toothbrush, he goes into a closet and he pulls out a suitcase and gets his toothbrush, which then that made me feel like he was just there to visit his mom. And I'm like, what? This is weird. If he's just visiting his mom, I, I mean, I guess in a way, if he loved his goldfish that much, maybe he was taken his goldfish to visit his mom with him? I don't know. But it just seemed a little weird. I was I was confused on the, does Remington live with his mom or is he just visiting? This is where the humor, I mean, there's definitely people who'd be like, oh, he's burying a goldfish. This is, it, they're not taking themselves serious at all. And yes, I could I could get why you would say that. But he, this is at the point where I was like, okay, this is, they definitely are not taking themselves serious. He takes this toothbrush out and he looks at it and he says something along the lines of, can't go to bed with a filthy mouth. And it's just like, that is just the weird, <laughs> the weirdest line to throw in this movie. Then he sees this like piece of paper kind of tucked under these Reeboks, uh, shoe box, and he pulls it out and, uh, he starts reading it like, if you'd like to experience the pleasure of pain, and immediately I get like two kind of vibes from this. I, I got the Beetlejuice vibe because in Beetlejuice, you know, there was like Beetlejuice is throwing those flyers out there for people to find and they're reading it. But at the same time, I got the Hellraiser vibe because of the whole pleasure of pain thing. So he's reading this like advertisement and it says something about say the magic words. So he says these magic words and he's like, hmm. And then he sets the paper down and then he grabs the shoe box and, and he opens it up. Now, if life has taught me anything, it's that you can't trust freaking shoe boxes in the back of people's closets. Don't go opening those things. Nine out of 10 times, you're either going to find shoes or old photos but let me tell you, it's that 10th time that's going to scar you for life. Don't go opening shoe boxes in the back of closets. I promise you, your life will be better. He opens the shoe box. And granted, I never found a portal to hell in any of the shoe boxes I opened. But portal to hell and this freaking Reebok shoebox. Being the man that he is, Remington's like, oh, hell no. And he goes and he throws it down this empty well outside. But also, Remington walks so freaking slow. I, I don't know. This, this man had, maybe it was just the, the depression of losing Goldie. He had, he had no strength in him. Just the grief was weighing him down so heavily he could not walk faster than a snail's pace in any scene whatsoever. The shoebox opens. Hell spills out, apparently. It crawls into the house somehow. He goes back inside. His mom's asking for some help in the bathroom. He opens up the bathroom. His mom is on fire. He freaks out, shuts the door. I, I could be wrong. I have no idea. But I swear he says something like, no more tacos, mom. I don't know. He runs away. Then we have this whole scene of his undead mom or his deadite mom following him around. Uh, he tries to get a gun. He goes out on the porch, but there's something 
weird, charred and dismembered sitting on the porch. It has a rope tied to it that's also tied to a larger something. And I could not, for the life of me, figure out what this was on the porch. It gets weird. He picks up this thing. He, he starts getting pulled by this rope and then hair wraps around his arms and he gets yanked away. In scene one, if you want to watch the rest of the movie, which I think at this point there's probably like another hour left, you're going to have to go and check that out on Apple TV or Vudu. There are, let me point out some criticisms. From scene one to the rest of the movie, the timeline is very confusing. You don't know if it's the very next day from scene one or it could be a couple years because there are some things that occur in the movie that would make you think that it has been quite a long time since scene one. But at the same time, there are things that make you feel like it has occurred quite quick from scene one. Uh, relationships, the, the guy Remington, what is his relationship to one of the characters that comes in in scene two is very confusing because in scene two, there's a girl who talks about how that property has been in her family for years, like way before she was even born. So does Remington have some kind of a, uh, is he related to her or were him and his mom squatters in this farmstead were were they renters? You don't know, which that was a little frustrating to me, not knowing the timeline, not knowing Remington's relationship to this girl or the family that owns the property. Where does he fit in with this? Why were they there? There's some contractors there to uh, look at this farm and talk about tearing it down. The question is brought up, the house is good. Why do you want to tear it down? That makes it sound like somehow the family that owns this property knows that some crazy crap has gone down in this place and they just want to tear it down. They don't want to deal with it anymore. They think the best option is to just get rid of it. So how did they find out? Again, that would mean that they have some kind of knowledge of Remington and what occurred that night with him and his mom. But there's no explanation for that, which is a little frustrating for me. When we come to the action scenes, which I'm going to call those the places where people are being punched, there's wrestling around, stuff of that nature. It really didn't hold a lot of weight. And I don't mean within the story itself it didn't hold weight. What I mean is none of the punches, none of the throws felt like it had force behind it. Everything felt like it was being held back a little bit or a lot of it. And the, uh, you know, like it, it never felt like what occurred because of the punch should have occurred because it never felt like it had any force or weight behind the punch, the throw, the anything like that. A storm occurs and which side note behind the scenes kind of information here, they had a rain machine and sometimes the temperature would drop to like 10 degrees and these people would be out there acting in the being wet and they are not dressed to be in temperatures in 10 degrees. They're in tank tops and shorts. And so they could only be out there for like a minute because it would get too cold. And then they'd have to go and then warm up again and then go back out and shoot again for a minute and then go warm up. So that was crazy. Anyway, the storm comes and two of the characters are trying to drive away in a truck, but a tree falls and blocks the road. And this is a nitpick for me. The tree branch that they used just didn't have the weight, the heft to it that made it seem like it was actually a deterrent. Uh, to me, the size of the branch was like, okay, just get up and move the branch, which I mean, essentially in the movie, that's what they were going to do. You know, it just didn't seem like something that could really keep you stopped. It almost was to the size where you could drive your truck over it in the first place. If they were able to find a, a trunk, a chunk of a tree that was bigger, that would have helped me out a little bit just to stay in the movie. But that that's a super nitpicky thing there. I cannot ignore the fact that this is heavy homage to Evil Dead. The first time you see somebody get possessed in this movie, immediately I'm thinking Deadite. 
there are a lot of similarities in evil dead you you've got the cabin in the woods in this movie you have a farm in the woods in evil dead you have the necronomicon where it's red and then evil is released and this one you have a little newspaper clipping with some magic words and you have the evil ass rebox shoe box there i mean the similarities are undeniable but at the same time this movie is enjoyable on its own within the limitations that it has just like evil dead had being the low budget movie that it was so when it's all said and done what are my thoughts on this movie when i'm going to compare it to other uh, high studio high money releases I'm going to give it like a four out of 10. But when I rate this on independent films, I'm literally, I'm going towards a seven, a high seven. Uh, the acting was not fantastic. Sometimes it was very cringe. The effects were good. This, as I mentioned before, diamond in the rough, if they had a little more money, which what cracks me up is you'll hear other people talk about low budget movies that have a budget of $2 million. These guys were working with $100,000 and some of these $2 million low budget movies are dog crap and malice trumps on them with their $100,000. I, again, I don't, I don't want to mislead you. This is a low budget Bad acting, action sequences are clunky, but for what it is, they deliver quite a lot. And as you all know, what is my final test for a movie? Would I watch this over the Terrifier franchise? And yes, I have to say franchise now, now that the third one is out. I would 100% watch malice over terrifier any day I, I would give it a recommendation for sure but it's not high caliber you have to know what you're watching i went in with low expectations and it exceeded my expectations i would love it if you guys would check this out again apple tv and voodoo is where you can uh, get a hold of this I would love you guys to check it out and I would love you to leave a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are. Um, where, where does this rank for you as far as independent horror films go? And definitely you got to keep in mind the budget here, hundred thousand Trompson on some of those low budget, $2 million films out there. I'm really grateful that Gerald reached out to me. Uh, again, I'm not trying to shill. This movie has problems, but as far as where my expectations were and what they met, good on you guys. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. I would appreciate it. And I really want to be part of this community. I would love for you guys to leave your comments. You got a problem with me? Go ahead, <laughs> leave a thumbs down. But if you're gonna do that, I would appreciate and I would ask that you leave a message kind of given why if you got a problem with uh, the audio got a problem with my cameras you think uh that i'm not funny fantastic i'd love to hear it some of it i can fix some of it i can't thanks for watching i'm judah this has been creeping it real